is from Faith Church, was mentioned just earlier. And uh, before we begin, I was just thinking that the last, I was trying to think if I've been here before. I've never been here for a service, but the last time and only time I was here, uh, my brother got married here. And I will say this, making sure I didn't lose the ring was far more nerve-wracking uh, than even <laughs> coming up here. So I think, uh, I think if anything, this will, this will be less, uh, less nerve-wracking. But nevertheless, uh, it's good to be here uh, with you all. If you would turn in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 9. Leviticus chapter 9, we're going to be looking at verses 22 uh, through chapter 10, verse 3. And if you are able, I would ask that you would please stand for the reading of God's word. Leviticus chapter 9, we'll begin at verse 22, reading through chapter 10, verse 3. This is God's word. Then Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them. And he came down from offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. And when they came out, they blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the pieces on, of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted, and fell on their faces. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and, authorized, and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. The grass withers and the flowers fade away, but the word of the Lord stands forever. You may be seated. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we come now to your word and we ask that you would enlighten our minds in the knowledge of Christ by your Spirit. And we pray that you would speak to us tonight. That those who need to be encouraged would be encouraged, and those who need to be challenged would be challenged. That we may grow in love for our Lord Jesus Christ, for it's in whose name we pray. Amen. Some of you may know the name Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins is a British evolutionary biologist and author of a host of books, one entitled The God Delusion. And in The God Delusion, Dawkins comments regarding the God of Scripture. He says that the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, capriciously malevolent bully. These words from a clear God hater. There's another category of people that you may come across in this world, and some even profess the name of Christ, who have somewhat of a similar view that the God of the somehow Old Testament is somehow different than the God, we may say, of the New Testament. There's some sort of distinction that others will want to draw between the God of the Old and the God of the New. And then we come to a third category. I pray that we find ourselves in that category. who are asking the question, what do we do with a text like this, how should we think about such an event as God being petty, as Dawkins alludes to? John Calvin says this, that if we reflect how holy a thing God's worship is, the enormity of the punishment 
will by no means offend us. And so as we look at a seemingly daunting text, sometimes even draws great fear, thinking about the realities which Nadab and Abihu had to face, we say with Calvin that if we understand the nature of what we're doing in worship, then the punishment will by no means offend us. And so this evening I want to look at this text under four different headings. First, the God whom we worship. Now I look at the sacrifice that was offered, the wrong sacrifice. Thirdly, what is the right sacrifice that is needed? And fourthly, the attitude in which we ought to worship. First, the God whom we worship. If there's anything that you can garner from this text, reading it, we see that the God whom we worship plays for keeps. He's a holy God, a righteous God. He is a jealous God. And this language of God's holiness and the distinction between that which is common and that which is unholy, we see all throughout the book of Leviticus. In fact, if you scroll down just or skip ahead just a few verses in your Bibles, you read these words. You are to distinguish between the holy and the common and between the unclean and the clean. This distinction between that which is holy and that which is unholy is of preeminence as we think about the God whom we come to worship. God is not only holy, but he's also a jealous God. And he's jealous particularly for the worship which his people give him. This is not new to the people. This is a theme throughout the pages of Scripture. God is jealous for his worship. We read about this, actually, in the early pages and the early chapters of Scripture. In Genesis chapter 4, we have the story of Cain and Abel. And they come before the Lord, and they both offer a particular sacrifice. And many times we think, well, uh, well Cain's offering was simply a matter of the heart. It was, it was, he did not come with the right attitude. But it seems more likely that, in fact, Cain's offering was not the right prescribed offering. That Abel offered the right sacrifice. And Cain offered the improper sacrifice. We see that God responds because he is a jealous God. Israel, as they're in the land of Egypt under slavery, the Lord says to Moses to go to Pharaoh and to tell him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. Include also that they may worship the Lord. God is concerned about the way in which we worship him. And then at Mount Sinai, he tells Moses, he says to tear down their altars and to break their pillars and cut down their asherim. Why do we do such things? For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. And what about Uzzah and the Ark of the Covenant? Uzzah approaches the Ark and he touches it in a manner that the Lord had not prescribed. And the Lord strikes Uzzah down because of it. The Lord is jealous about how he is worshipped. We might think, why can he not just overlook? Why is it such a big deal that we worship God properly? It's actually because of who he is. Who God is actually demands that we worship him in a particular way. Because God is glorious and he possesses all glory in and of himself. No other idol, no other being is to be worshipped. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8, the Lord says that I am the Lord and that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Because of who God is, my glory, I will not give to any other. He's also the creator, and as the creature, we owe our obedience to him as the creator. Psalm 95, O come, let us worship and bow down, let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. He's also the redeemer, the one who has redeemed us, ought to be worshipped 
for that very fact. Paul in Romans chapter 12 says that, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves as a living sacrifice. This is your spiritual worship. So God deserves worship. He is holy and he is jealous. This is the God whom we worship. We also see the nature of the sacrifice that was offered. The wrong sacrifice that was offered, particularly we read about it in chapter 10, verse 1. It was an unauthorized fire, and this notion uh, that uh, the author records for us is that it was not commanded by the Lord. Various views as to what exactly was this unauthorized fire that Nadab and Abihu offered before the Lord, and I'm not exactly sure what exactly what that fire looked like. What was it? Where did it come from? But nevertheless, what we do find out is that God is not only concerned about the attitude of the worshiper, he's also concerned about what is done in worship. Nadab and Abihu offer fire which the Lord had not commanded them, meaning what they should have done was what God had commanded them. And so likewise for us, what we ought to do is not what we desire, what we please, but rather what God has indeed commanded us in the scriptures. And so while attitude and disposition are nevertheless important, what we do in worship is also just as important in worship. Again, to you reuse the same examples that we've just used with Cain and Abel. What was offered was important. For Uzzah at the ark, how he approached the ark was just as important as his attitude at the ark. And if you think, well, this is an Old Testament reality, you turn to the Gospels and we read Jesus speaking with the Samaritan woman. And he says to her, the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. You see, Jesus reaffirms the old covenant reality that how and what we do in worship matters. You see, our worship must be according to truth. You scan the scene of the broad church scene throughout our own context, our own nation, even worldwide. It doesn't take an expert to see that worship has fallen on hard times. Many have left the church, even in the last number of years particularly, but this is no new phenomenon. People leaving the church, and the church responding with, we must change our strategy. We must adapt and adopt to the pleasures of the world. And the church has now begun to act more like a business than like a church. One pastor commenting on this reality, says that the church has begun to adopt some of these principles. And here's what he says. He says, there is this instinct in corporate America that when your business falters, what do you do? You go back to your customers and you try to identify what are their needs. What are their desires? And then you give it to them. He's commenting, he's saying this is what oftentimes the church does. And he says, further, we're kind of half right and all wrong. Because the customer is always right. But the customer and the consumer of worship is not man. It's God. God is the one who consumes the worship of his people. And as such, he is the one who dictates 
how we worship. He is the consumer. The non-Christian outside is not the consumer. God is the consumer. And so as the church of Christ, we must steer clear of any thinking which treats worship as that which can be done on our terms, apart from the scriptures. And to treat worship like the Israelites did at Mount Sinai, thinking, let's worship Yahweh, but let's do so by our own means, creating a golden calf. And it makes sense to do that. Because what happens is, we have pulled God down, and we have trivialized him, and we now treat him as though he is like us. And so it, of course, makes sense. If we have pulled God down, and he is simply like one of us, he is my pal and my buddy, then I worship him as I would worship any other. Rather, our worship must be constrained and regulated by what God himself has told us. And you may think, but that's restrictive. The New Covenant, the New Testament is is freeing. More on that in just a few moments. But what about the right sacrifice? We we don't see it in the text. But what was, why was it so significant that the right sacrifice be offered? Well, if you think about the nature of Nadab and Abihu's work, They were serving the Lord as priest before God. And it is in that light, in their priestly activity, that we understand that there needs to be a faithful high priest. Adam and Eve in the garden serving God as these vice regents in God's garden temple serving him as priestly figures. And in their sin, they are banished from the garden. And so, as you progress throughout the revelation of Scripture, you realize there needs to be a proper high priest to offer sacrifices to God according to what God desires. And we find out in this story, if anything else, Nadab and Abihu are not that. But the right sacrifice the right high priest is ultimately found not in Aaron's seed, but rather we find out in the line of Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, the greater high priest who comes and he offers to God the proper worship, the proper sacrifice for those who were fallen. Paul says in Galatians chapter 4, that Christ comes and offers an obedient to God under the law in order to redeem those who were under the law. A priest, a high priest, the high priest, had to offer proper worship. We sometimes call this the active obedience of Jesus, of Christ, that he came and he obeyed the law at every point. And he did so, as our confession and catechism speaks, he did so as prophet, priest, and king. Christ as the great high priest, offering before the Lord proper worship. And you hear his words in the Garden of Gethsemane. In severe tribulation. Do you remember those words which he utters? Not my will but yours be done. The true high priest offers proper worship according to what God would have it to be. And so we, as those who are destitute of that righteousness, of that proper worship, need one who would come and who would stand in our place and like Zechariah, In chapter 3, needing those filthy rags removed, the righteous robes placed over him, so we say with Augustus Toplady, not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? 
all for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. And that is what Christ does as the great high priest. He comes, and he offers the right sacrifice to God. And now, as those who have been united to him, we now come. And so the question is, how are we to worship God? We see a little taste of this in how Aaron responds to what just took place. Just put yourself in his shoes for just a moment. You have just seen your two sons struck down. And it says that Aaron held his peace. Because of who God was, he just saw the holy and jealous and righteous God, and the only proper response is to hold one's peace. It is a matter of fear and reverence. Professor John Murray, commenting on the fear of the Lord, says that the fear of the Lord is the soul of godliness. This is encapsulated in Aaron's response to God. It is who God is that directs us how we ought to respond. Fear and trembling. You may say, well, again, this is restrictive. This is Old Covenant realities. This is Old Testament. This is not how we are to worship any longer. If you would, turn over with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 reminds us that the ethic of worship is the same in Old and New Testaments. Yes, Christ has brought us near, but nevertheless, the response to a holy and righteous God is indeed the same. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 12, beginning at verse 25. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At this time his voice shook the earth, the earth, but now he has promised. Yet once more I will shake not only the earth but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. See, that is the attitude and the disposition of those who come to worship God. It is because of what God has done and who he is that we respond to him in reverence and awe. Again, Professor Murray commenting, he uses some dated language, uh, nevertheless, uh, still the principle I think remains. He says that adoration springs from the apprehension of God's majesty. And where this is, there must be reverence. Here again, much of our worship falls under the charge of irreverence and therefore under condemnation. There is a place in life for jollity and jollification. But how alien to the worship of God would this be in the sanctuary? How alien would this be in the sanctuary? And we may hear these sorts of things I think this is, this is depressing. Uh, we come in and we scowl on our faces and fear and reverence. We need to sit there and we must be quiet. That's precisely not the way in which the scriptures describe what it means to be trembling before the Lord. It is not some stoic, unmoved behavior. But to worship in fear and reverence is actually the most freeing and joyful way God can be worshipped. Why is that? Well, it's because that's precisely how God prescribed it to be. 
And if anybody knows what would bring us the most joy and the most edification, it would be God. And so God has prescribed to us in his word as the great physician who, when dealing with a patient, prescribes a particular medicine to meet their needs. Now, alien it would be for the patient to say, actually, I have better medicine. No, rather, the patient joyfully takes that prescribed medicine and takes it because he knows that the physician has his best interest in mind. And so we take what God has revealed to us from Genesis to Revelation, and we, pres- we take the prescription And we implement it in our worship as we do in even our own tradition. We do so with reverence and awe, knowing that this is indeed what is best for us. And the result is joy and love for God. If someone was to ask you or tell you that you had One more day to live. You can do anything you would please with that moment, with with those days ahead, or that day ahead. What would it be? What would you want to do? There may be a host of responses. I may want to hike a particular mountain, or see a particular destination, or meet a particular person. If you asked King David that, he would have had a particularly different, different answer. Psalm 27 records maybe what David would have responded to that question. David says, One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. May that be the cry of our hearts, to be in God's sanctuary, gazing upon, as David says, the beauty of the Lord. May that be our prayer this evening. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, how good it is to thank the Lord, to sing your praises, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that you have brought us near by the greater high priest, that we may come and offer acceptable worship to you with fear and reverence. We praise you and thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Well, in conclusion, let's, I guess, stand and...